Welcome to the Win Make Give podcast, a Ben Kinney training production, where we discuss the concepts of health, wealth, leadership, and legacy. My name is Chad Himes, and I am your host, joined by my co-host, Bob Stewart. Hello, Bob. Hi, Chad. We're going to jump today into a conversation that Ben had with Clint Swindoll. Let me introduce you to Clint if you don't know him. Clint Swindoll is the president and CEO of Verbalocity. It's a personal development company with a focus on leadership enhancement. Clint is going to share some amazing things with Ben during this conversation. Before we get to it, Bob, we want to give a warning to our audience. Yeah, yeah. So there's a certain segment in here, Chad, that on its surface seems a little bit crude. And so as you get, and you'll know what I'm talking about once you get in here and listen, but when you get to that segment, I would just encourage you to, to kind of bear with us until you get to the payoff because there's a you know really meaningful message in it. It's delivered in a little bit of a crude format, but I don't think that there's any explicit language necessarily, right? But you'll, you'll know what I'm talking about. Absolutely. And I think the way they deliver it they even ask us to take this out of the recording, and we've just decided to leave it yeah, in. We're, we're going to leave it in there for you guys because it's a good message. There you go. And I think it'll help them remember the message the way that it is put together. All right. Now, Bob, as always, we want your word going into this conversation. So set us up. What is it we should be listening for as we hear Ben and Clint talk? I think that my word is awareness. And as we get in here, as you get in and listen to this conversation, you can tell that both of these guys are highly aware leaders. They're not, you know, they, they don't wonder what's going on in their organization. They're fully aware and they're engaged in that awareness and they're constantly striving to be more aware. So I, I would say, listen for that awareness that you hear coming from these guys. And then how can you, you know, how does that benefit to them as they run their organizations? All right, with that being said and our warning being given, Let's have fun with this conversation between Ben and Clint. You wrote a book called Engage Leadership, Building a Culture to Overcome Employee Disengagement. Sure. Tell us about why did you write this? Sure. So um, my corporate background was a company that is now AT&T, and uh, I was in a leadership development program that was designed to move you up the ladder very quickly. Uh, they, they said, you know, we promise if you do a good job, uh, we're going to take care of you. We're going to move you up the ladder. We're going to promote you. We're going to pay you a bunch of money. Everything's we're going to put you with the CEO of, of, of a major company uh, and with, with some one on one time. And I was there for six years, had eight different jobs, went through customer service, technical, financial, sales, marketing, all these different disciplines. They did exactly what they promised. I got to the end of those six years uh, and I did the only thing that made any sense at all. I quit. I packed up my stuff and I left and I said, that world may be right for somebody, but it's not right for me. And while I was there, I, I looked around and I realized there were some good examples of leadership, but there were also some very, very poor examples of leadership. And I thought, you know, if, if there was some way, uh, if, if someone had shared with me what I thought would have been the right model, uh, I would, um, I think I would have quite possibly still been there today. Uh, but some of those bad leaders, like that evil little man, he was one of them. Uh, there were just some horrible examples. And I said, you know what, I want... I want to write something that I think truly will engage people because, quite frankly, you know, there's an effort to try to create satisfied employees. Well, if we can just have happy employees, then we'll be better. I think the bar is too low if satisfaction is our goal. I think engagement has to be the goal because if I can get you engaged, well, then you're satisfied. I mean, who's ever left in an organization said, man, it is just so engaging here. I mean, they really take care of you. I think I'm going to leave. You were talking earlier about building a model that no one ever wants to leave. Part of that leadership aspect is engagement. Once you're engaged in an organization, you don't want to leave. So I wanted to, to, uh, to create something with a model in it. And not only is it a model, but you'll find that the first two-thirds of the book is a fable. It's uh, but not like a rat and cheese fable. It's like a real business fable uh, of a guy named Seth Owen who goes through uh, his first job straight out of college trying to figure out how to, how to build a culture of engagement with a boss that took him under her wing. Uh, and 80% of that first year of mine in corporate America uh, is me as Seth Owen in that book. So uh, you'll read through that book and know uh, that it's real. The, the other 20% is the stuff I wish somebody had taught me. And so I just included that in the book to say now, to me, that's a complete model. So that was the, that was the goal. I didn't share this with you, but I spent the first six years of my working adult career working for the same shitty company. I worked for AT&T. I survived their split off when they broke into four business sure, components, sure. wireless, broadband, core yeah, yeah. services, and so on. 
it was a horrible place yep. to work. Yep. It was like yep. a hierarchy of bosses oh. and titles and 4,000 VPs and yep. uh, politics. Run them up. I got laid off twice there. My joke always was I got canned more than tuna. <laughs> Because literally every time they wanted to adjust the stock price, they, they would let us go. Yeah. And then like turns out they needed our department and they'd hire us back six yeah. months later. Yeah. It was chaos. Yeah. Right? Yeah. My boss, who's, um, he was a great boss. He was a five foot nothing uh, Italian guy who had one job, which was working at AT&T TCI for his entire career. Uh, prior to that, he was a shortstop for a professional baseball team. So he's only, the only thing he's ever worked. My last day at the company was the day that he was laid off. They laid him off. He'd worked there since 1960-something. He was two years away from retirement. And when they laid him off and they, and they kept me, I knew that this was not the company for me. Yep. Right? Yep. And I left because there wasn't no leadership there. Yep. It was just corporate hierarchy. That's right. What do you think uh, makes a good leader? I think uh, Compassion. Uh, which is one of the things that has been so impressive for me standing in the back of the room this morning listening to what you were doing that uh, The changes that you want to make and you, as you know from AT&T if there were ever initiatives that were being rolled out It was to it was to uh, somehow benefit an individual because if that worked they were going to get promoted uh, If it worked they were going to get a big, big bonus everything about that model uh, was about self-preservation uh, And I believe quite frankly that what people want today is they want compassion uh, they want consistency. They don't want that boss that bounces all over the screen. They want transparency. They want real. They don't want to feel like uh, the person that they see standing here is any different than the guy out in the hallway. And I think too often, leaders believe that's two different things. My follow-up book to engage leadership is a book called Living for the Weekday, uh, because I believe one of the challenges is that we, we have a five-day countdown to a weekend, uh, as though this two-day respite at the end of the week is somehow going to make everything better. I believe that the most successful people I have encountered in this lifetime are those who found a way to look forward to Monday as much as they look forward to Friday. And so that they, they don't, don't get me wrong, I love my hobby, I love the weekend, uh, but I don't count down the days to get there because I'm doing something that I truly am passionate about and I enjoy doing. Uh, and so and it gives people an opportunity to realize that the guy that stands uh, at the back of a firebox uh, on a weekend uh, smoking brisket uh, is the same guy that stands on this stage. Uh, or someone who sits in my living room is going to say, that's the same guy that I saw speaking to 7,000 people. Same guy in my living room as I am on a stage in front of 7,000. I think that's what people are looking for from their leaders as well. They want to know that they're real. They want to know that they're transparent. And they want to know that their leader actually has some sort of compassion for them. That it's not just, what can you give to me? I'm going to pull everything I can out of you. I'm going to drain every ounce of, of your knowledge and energy to make my company successful. I think they want somebody that says, you know, if I'm going to give that much, I want to know that you actually care. That if I walk in the office and for whatever reason there's something bothering me, that, that I have a boss that might actually walk over and say, Clint, is there something bothering you today? I mean, you don't have to tell me what it is. I just want you to know if you need something, I'm there for you. And I want to get in your personal stuff if you don't want to share your personal stuff, but I just want you to know, I hope everything's okay. You know, sometimes we have people who come into an office and they drag themselves in and they've gone through a major loss in their life. And at some point they go, you know, my boss doesn't even know because my boss has never even noticed that I'm not myself. Because quite frankly, he or she just doesn't truly care. I think they want compassion. You know, a good leader looks for cues. I, I, I have a strong group of people here that are very successful and driven. And uh, what if I ask them how they're doing and I should be asking them to tell me something good, but uh, I didn't. And they say it's fine. I know it's not fine. Right, right, right. right. When somebody in your organization says, "I'm fine," you know, they're not fine. My first question is, "Have you eaten anything today?" Because there's no negotiating negotiating with hangry, yeah, yeah. right? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. After I know that they've eaten, then I can dive in and see what's really, really, really wrong. Negotiations take place at nine in the morning or one in the afternoon. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Because that's they have it. to either just eat breakfast or lunch, one or the other. Yeah, we were talking yesterday and said, I'm going to have you up at the glory hour right after lunch. And we both looked at each other because we know what that means. He's like, oh, man, I, I, as long as they're not eating, I said, don't finish that sentence because I know exactly what you're going to say. And he looked at me and I look at him and I say, it's Mexican, Mexican food. food. So, <laughs> so I'm, I'm, Without a question. So I'm from San Antonio. So that's where that whole, because, so I do a lot of speaking in, in San Antonio because conferences and conventions, big corporate uh, uh, convention town. So I do a lot of speaking there. And when meeting planners go there, they don't know any better 
uh, than to not eat the local food. And so they're like, well, we're in San Antonio, so we have to have a Mexican buffet. And so there's cheese enchiladas and all this stuff spread out. And about 2 o'clock in the afternoon uh, is when the high fat hangover kicks in. Uh, and then there's a downhill slide from there. Some of you <laughs> have been experiencing that, I know, I have no doubt. Uh, but you did a good job. I mean, you, stood, you, you were champs. You were right there the whole time. Uh, so, yeah, I, there's no, no question. Yeah, uh, we, both, we both knew that. Yeah, yeah and I apologize no, for it. No, no, no. You, you said something last night. You said that... I, I go into organizations and I survey their, their people or yep. whatever, and, and then you identify a problem. Yep. And then you coach and mentor them over the year, and then you go back and you give the yep. same survey. Yep. What is the most common problems in an organization that you've encountered? I think, uh, w- without a doubt, related to the survey, uh, it's internal communications. Uh, particularly interdepartmental communications. You know, we get into organizations, and as they get bigger and bigger, those silos become stronger and stronger. And without question, one of the biggest issues that come back out on surveys uh, is interdepartmental communication. And it really doesn't matter uh, how good the organization is. It doesn't matter how well or how hard they work on improving it. I believe quite often people hear what they want to hear. So you could literally stand up in front of this group and say something. I could walk out in the hallway and interview every one of you going out and I would have five different versions of what you talked about this morning. Because everybody just hears things differently. And we hear often what we want to hear. And I think that's part of the challenge that happens in an organization as well. It's just uh, people want to hear what they want to hear, and they don't listen to the full story. And then, and then rumors spread, uh, because there will be some of you uh, who will talk amongst yourselves, and you're going to share a completely different story than what somebody else heard. And that uh, can be very detrimental to an organization. I had a conversation with one of my people the other day, and I said, oh, I told you about that. And she looks at me, she says, you didn't tell me about that. I'm like, I'm pretty sure I told you about that. And yeah. we're staring at each other. We're not really sure which one of us is right at that moment, but being right is super important. So both of us are sta- <laughs> staring at each other, right, right, N- not naming names via, but we were weirdest, weirdest. I told you about that. No, you did not tell me about that. But it is, that is a challenge because, especially in our world, we move, we move quick. Yeah. Right, we're new products, new features, new companies, growth. We're, we're at that point in our time where, where, where we have that. So how do you solve it? I think, uh, again, quite frankly, it's a matter of consistency of the message. You too often will say it one time, and then we just assume that everyone will get it. Uh, sometimes it's a matter of not just the consistency of the message, but in multiple formats. Well, I sent you an email on that. Well, I used to <laughs> have a former client that... CEO of a really large company uh, that wanted an update on something, and I sent him an email. Uh, I said, I'm going to tell you every Monday exactly where we are with the project, and so I would send him an email every Monday, and after about a month, he's like, I need to know where we are on this deal. I'm like, dude, I've been sending you an email every single Monday. He's like, dude, I don't read my email. Why are you sending me an email? And uh, I said, you want me to send you a text? He said, I don't don't read my text either. So often, it's a matter of having not just the consistency, but a change in format of that message because everybody gets the message differently. Some people prefer email, some people prefer a phone call, some people prefer a text. Uh, So I think it's a matter of changing up the delivery of that message as well. I run into that problem as a leader here too because I'll start every meeting about the same way. I'll talk about our mission, vision, and values, and I'll jump into the value of home ownership. And when I do my classes, they're gonna hear me saying the same thing. And I think some people feel like, I already know this stuff. But they aren't living that stuff, right. right? They're living that stuff. Their life would be in a different spot. So yeah. we have to continue to say the same exact thing over and over, over again. And over and over and over. You and me were talking about uh, buttholes last night. Can you, can you like, what? buttholes. <laughs> oh, buttholes. Oh, yeah. Sure. sure. Yeah, we had a yeah. long conversation yeah, about did. buttholes. we did. And, sure. And I was, li- I was laying there. Cal- calm down. I, I, was, I was laying there last night, and I was thinking about these buttholes. And I thought that that's a really that's a really profound statement. Yeah. Yeah. That that is a profound concept. So before I end up on uh, some sort of a news organization <laughs> slash in my HR department, will you help me recover from that statement? Sure, absolutely. And Chad, if you can cut that part out of the podcast whenever you, yeah. you splice that right, out or yeah. whatever, yeah, that'd be good. Uh, no one need that in there about Ben and I talking about buttholes. Uh, but <laughs> but we were. But we were. Yeah, we, indeed, yeah. it was true. Yeah. yeah. So my my my. My observation uh, has been, and we talked about this last night, that some people, they start down a very positive road of, you know, uh, it it should be a good day today, uh, but it's supposed to rain this afternoon. They can't stop with the good. They have to, you have that, that conjunction of the but. 
You know, so you're, you know, it's, it's going to be a great day, uh, but it's going to be windy this afternoon. Uh, it's finally going to stop uh, raining tomorrow, but it's going to be humid this afternoon. I mean, it doesn't, I, I hope you have a good holiday, but I know you're going home to your family, so I know what that <laughs> usually means. It's like they can't stop with the good, they, they, they have to put a butt in there. I said, it's like they're walking down, the, walking down the street, and everything is good, and they're saying something good, and then they fall in the hole. Well, it's a, it's a butt hole. <laughs> Because they're walking along, everything's good, but, and they fall in the hole. So the point is, you need to avoid the buttholes. So, indeed, last night, we spent a great deal of time talking about buttholes. So, and and the potential title of my third book is going to be, Avoid the Buttholes. (laughs) Because of the double entendre there of, there's going to be a chapter about avoiding those buttholes, too, that, that cause grief in your life. Yeah, one T. One T, exactly. One T, yeah. One T. So it's, it's, it's avoid the buttholes, one T. Yeah. Indeed, yes. I have a fair amount of critics in my life, and, and I have a lot of them come up, and they'll, they'll be here today. You did a really good job today, Ben, but... But. Right? They're yeah. going to they're fall into the butthole. They're going to fall into the butthole. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, they're going to point out what I missed or what I forgot yep. Or, yep. or I forgot to mention somebody's name or yep. whatever that might be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So how do we avoid falling into that butthole? You know, it's interesting... Just like I was sharing other things that my wife and I struggle with every day, that too is one of those. Uh, as I'm a writer, uh, and so uh, I'm regularly either writing a script to do a video or doing something, and I literally have to stop myself, because I will write it that way, and have to stop and use another word, or completely restructure a sentence so that there is no need for a conjunction in the middle. And often it's a matter of literally stopping that that point before you move on to the next. You did a great job today, Ben. Period. If there were an opportunity for you to improve, I assume you'd want to know what it is. Well, yeah. I would probably have stayed on the stage instead of getting down, or I would have stayed down there instead of going. Whatever the improvement is, it's amazing to me how most people just can't leave well enough alone. And there's often there's there's something good on the other side of the of the butt. I mean, there's there's a, a conversation to be had there. But too often when we get to the butt, everything we said before it doesn't matter. You did a good job today, Ben. But man, you really should have stayed down or whatever. Well, you don't hear you really did a good job today. You're too busy bowing up trying to say, well. I didn't see you up there doing it, you know, and all of a sudden we become defensive. Yeah. I think it's literally a matter of changing our vocabulary. By the way, yet is not a bad word to use in place of but. Yeah. You did a good job today, Ben, yet there probably were some things that you, know, you might want to consider doing differently. Yet is a softer word than but. The ultimate, ultimate solution is to completely eliminate it, put a period right there, and just don't even bother saying what's on the other side. It's going to be a nice day today, but it's probably going to be humid this afternoon. What, what is the value in sharing that? Just stop the comment right there. When you get to the point where you want to throw in a butt, ask yourself if there's actually value on the other side of that statement. That's a really profound statement. And often there's no value on the other side of the butt. Because if you're with a good, transparent leader who wants to improve, if you said, hey, Ben, you did a good job today, and you just went silent, I'd probably say, thank you. And then I would say, what could I have done better? Yep. Yep. Right? And I would have invited that, sure. that input back in them because I do care about what I could have yeah, done yeah. better. Instead of the, but you probably could have dressed up at least one time this year, Ben. <laughs> right? Or so, something like that, right? Yeah. Well, and you know, interestingly enough, if you stop the sentence, you did a great job today, Ben. Either you're going to say, well, is there anything I could have improved on? Or you might say, but you know, maybe I should have dressed a little, you then recognize it versus the other person being the one to throw that in. You did a great job today, Ben. And then Ben says, yeah, maybe I, I probably should have done this or do it. Because you know, I mean, we often know what we could have done better, right? We just don't need anybody telling us. That's all the butt does. It's somebody telling us usually something that we already know. Yeah, well and we don't want to take that criticism. And so we bow up. I think the other thing real quick uh, related to the give part that I, I, I just admire about your culture here uh, is that it's not just about, uh, about building a business. Uh, it's not just about making more money. Uh, it's about giving back. Uh, and it's about giving generously and doing good, 
most companies, I work with a lot of companies, most companies don't have that as a part of their mission and their vision of what they ultimately want to be as an organization. And research shows that the millennial generation right now, that's a high priority for them. They want to work for an organization uh, that is philanthropic. They want to work for an organization that gives back. And for that to be a part of your, of your, your, your purpose, the reason you exist, I think it's incredible. I really do. And I think that matters uh, to people. And uh, I was sharing with you last night uh, the foundation uh, that we created. My wife and I, we don't have children of our own, uh, but that we listened to a whisper from God telling us that we were to help other children uh, who had been abandoned, abused, and neglected. Uh, and uh, there's a, a book uh, out there called uh, Holy Discontent. Uh, and the book basically says, if you want to find the bigger purpose for your existence, find that thing, that social injustice, that thing that makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up, that thing that pisses you off. When you find that, is it, is it animal abuse? Is it the fact that there are children who go to bed hungry? Is it the fact that adults go to bed hungry when we have unlimited access to, to uh, food resources? Uh, what, what is, is it cancer that, because that horrible disease took somebody from you? Uh, what is it that makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up? When you figure that out, then you have found your bigger purpose. And when you start contributing your time, your talent, and your treasure in some way to help overcome that challenge, then you have indeed started fulfilling your purpose. I think that's part, and that's part of the living for the weekday model as well. And I think some people never find satisfaction in their life because they, they do all the other things. They're, they're pursuing business. They're, they're growing. They're doing well. They're making money. They may even be giving money away, but they don't have that connection to say, this is important to me, though, rather than, well, I support all, anybody that calls and asks. That's, that's who I stroke the check to. No, what's your passion? And when you know what that is, then I believe that you have figured out why you're down here on this earth. And so for my wife and I, uh, it's knowing that there are children who have been abandoned, abused, and neglected. So uh, you started a foundation. We did. What's so, it called? Uh, it's called the First Chance Foundation. What's it do? Uh, so we financially support organizations that are on the front line of dealing with children who are abandoned, abused, and neglected. We have a, a small, uh, I say small, it's a, they probably have a million dollar a year budget uh, for abandoned, abused, and neglected children on a ranch not far from our house. And when we were first moving up into the Texas Hill Country, north of San Antonio, uh, we went to look at a piece of property and a house. Uh, it wasn't what we wanted, but pulling out of the parking lot instead of going left, I turned right. Kind of a story I remember hearing you talk That's about. right. I turned right as well. And I drove down that road. Uh, you uh, didn't run into a, a dead end. I ran into a cul-de-sac. And as I went around the cul-de-sac, I looked over and I saw this sign that said, St. Jude's Ranch for Children. I remember thinking, I wonder what that's for. And I assumed it was probably the St. Jude's hospital kind of deal. Turns out it's not. Um, and it was for abandoned, abused, and neglected children. And I remember thinking, I wonder what that's about. And then I let it go. Probably a couple weeks later went by. I'm sitting there at my desk, and I remember it went through my head again. I'm like, I wonder what that's about. I let it go again. Finally, about a week goes by. It pops in my head again. I'm like, all right, God, I don't know what it is you want me to do, but I'll go figure this thing out. So I, I called him on the phone. I said, tell me what you need. And they said, soap. We have 34 kids out here. And we need a lot of soap. I said, no, 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 no. What do you need? Tell me what, if you got something, what would you need? She said, soap. We have a lot of dirty, dirty kids. <laughs> and I'm like, apparently you're not getting it. I will be there shortly. I hung up the phone. I hollered at my wife, Heather. I said, Heather, get in the truck. We're going to St. Jude's Ranch for Children. We drove out there and saw this very meager existence. About three weeks later, we were at a, a fundraiser for juvenile diabetes. That night alone at this event, they raised $4 million at that event. And uh, they did one of the reverse bidding where they say, okay, who can give 10000 You raise your paddle. Who can give $25,000? Uh, there was a grandfather sitting in the front with his grandbaby in his lap, and he started the bidding by raising his paddle and say, I give $1 million. And I turned to my wife and I said, you know, if we gave $5,000 at this event, if we gave $10,000, it would be a rounding error at this event. It's that significant. They're not going to get to the end of the night and go, congratulations, we raised $4 million and... $5,000. I mean, literally, it's going to get lost <laughs> in the rounding yeah, error. I yeah. mean, it's like nothing. And I said, but you know what? $5,000 can make a difference in the lives of those kids out there. And I said, and by the way, I don't have a passion for juvenile diabetes because I don't know anybody that has it. But that grandfather and all those people raising those paddles, 
they're connected to it. We give where we feel the connection mm-hmm. of something. And uh, for my wife and I, uh, we realized it was, it was this completely inappropriateness that their children, who have done nothing in most cases, to deserve to be abandoned, abused, or neglected. They just were. They were born into the wrong family. They were around the wrong people. And, and as a result of that, we committed our lives to say we're going to do everything we can to help those kids who have been abandoned, abused, and neglected. And so uh, for the first 10 years, we did it on our own. We didn't tell anybody about it. We literally funded it ourselves. Uh, and then we had a little... Uh, uh, ten-year uh, celebration. We said, let's have a celebration of ten years of doing this nonprofit stuff. We'll invite some people over to our house. We'll have a little party. Maybe we can raise five thousand dollars in our backyard. Twenty-five dollars a ticket. Uh, we do competition barbecue. Uh, so we and we do a really good rib. Uh, and I like margaritas because I live in San Antonio. So we create an event called Ribs and Ritas. It was Makes nice. sense. And and it's and, and and it rhymes. So it was and it looks really cool in the logo. So we created Ribs and Ritas. So let's see if we can raise five thousand dollars. We had a little event in our backyard. And uh, that night, we hoped to raise 5000 We raised $26,000. Wow. When was um, that? I'm sorry? When was that? That was five years ago. Yeah. And uh, so and we raised uh, just over $26,000. Uh, a friend of mine came to me the next year and said, hey, you can do your event again. I said, yeah, I am. I said, but I can't do it in my backyard. I've already run out of room. I don't have room to park all these cars anymore. And we really want to grow. He said, I have a, I have a facility on my ranch. Let's do it on my ranch. So we moved out to his ranch. He said, what's your goal going to be? I said, we didn't think we'd get to 5000 We got to 26000 So I think the goal needs to be 100000 and he said, that's a big goal. I said, yes, it is. And we're going to do everything we can to get there. We got to the end of the night. We got to 91,000. Uh, the third year, we said, well, we got to go for 150. We're going to go big. We got to 138,000. The next year, we said, we got to go to 175. We got to 176. So we finally met our goal. And this last year, we said, we're going for 200. And we got to 206. In five years, uh, we've raised uh, $635,000 wow. to help children who have been abandoned. How many? Yeah. How many kids do you think that helps? You know, the, uh, we, we've often talked about that. We've always wanted to know what's, what's the impact, the significance yeah. of that. I mean, is that, yeah. uh, and it's something you'll, you'll never know. Yeah. I mean, what's your guess, Tony? Yeah, you know, it's obviously thousands. Yeah. There's just no question in yeah. our mind that, um, and a quick, real quick story. Uh, we, we do birthdays for all those kids out at the ranch, too. We don't do a, hey, if you're born in uh, January, you know, we're going to have a party. Every kid gets their own personal birthday. We have 16-year-old kids that have come up with tears in their eyes saying, I've, I've never had a birthday party. Literally, no one has celebrated my birth in 16 years. Wow. It's just absolutely Heartbreaking, And so one of our commitments is, uh, and when I say we, I mean my wife, uh, I, I go find the money, uh, she spends it. Some of you may be familiar with that model. Um, but I go, I go raise the money, and then she spends it as the kind of, she's the executive director of the, of the foundation. And she goes and, and is on the front lines with those folks uh, helping uh, support all those things. And one of the things she does is she does these birthday parties for these kids. One year, a kid had asked for a, a, a pencil set uh, to, to do draw, drawings and a pad and all that stuff. She get, gets him for him for his birthday. About a month later, she goes back to the ranch for another birthday in the same house. The little boy was there. He walked up and he handed my wife this little portrait that he had painted. He was a kid, maybe 12 years old. Uh, and, and it was a picture uh, of an angel. You see the wings with a big rainbow over the top. And my wife said, what, what is this? And he said, uh, it's you. And she said, well, what do you mean it's me? And she said, every time you come to our house, all I see are rainbows and angels. Wow. And he gave that to her. So after our, our first year, we had uh, the, the fundraiser. She said, I want to put this in a frame, and I'm going to give it. We're going to pull a name out of that. We're going to give it to one of the people who came and supported us in our first year. So we pull a name. This guy gets it, takes it home. A month before the event comes around uh, the, the next year, he calls me, and he says, hey, Clint, I know you don't do a, a live auction. We do now, but at the time, we didn't do a live auction. He said, I know you don't do a live auction, but I want to bring this back. And I want, to, I want you to auction this off. But here's the deal. It's a five-year auction. Whoever gets it has to bring it back, and we're going to re-auction it the next year. And whoever gets it, they get to keep it for a year, but they have to bring it back, and we're going to do that five years. At the end of five, year, five years, it goes home to you and Heather. I said, man, what a deal that is. Man, we'll, we'll raise $1,000 a year, make, make $5,000 off some little kid's painting. That's awesome. First year, it sold for $10,000. The second year, it sold for $11,000. The third year it sold for 14000 and my largest donor was sitting in the front this year, and it got to 8000 I couldn't get any higher. I do the auction. I'm not an auctioneer, but that's one of the things that we say. We don't want anybody that stands up front going, hey, 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 hey,
it is us. We started it, and we're the ones on the stage. And I say, I don't know how to do, be an auctioneer, but you'll give me 2000 Anybody give me 3000 2000 3000 I got 3000 That's it. And that's as good as my auctioneering skills are. Uh, and uh, I got to 8000 I couldn't get anybody to go higher. And so I said, well, we're going to sell it at 8000 and, and a good friend of mine uh, in the front raised his hand. He said, um, he said, I think that little painting is worth $15,000. And so I thought, well, he wants it to go for more than it went last year. He was the one that bought it for 10000 the first year. And I thought, he's, he's, gonna, he's just going to buy it for 15000 He said, I'm going to match up to 15000 Whatever you can get these people in this room to donate, $100 at a time or 500 or whatever their ability is, whatever you raise, I'll match it up to 15000 I said, okay. First hand goes up. I said, yeah, how much you want to give? He said, I'll give you five. I said, 500. He said, no, 5,000. I said, okay. Another hand went up. He said, I'll give you five. I said, 500. He said, no, 5,000. About that time, my friend got up to walk to the bar. As he was walking to the bar, I said, hey, his name's Ronnie. I said, hey, Ronnie. Uh, and it was a group about this size, maybe a little less, about 300 people. And I said, hey, Ronnie, uh, before you go get too far, uh, did you say you were going to match up to 15,000? Or did you say you were going to man up and match up anything that is offered in this room today? <laughs> I know his ego is pretty big. And he turned around and bowed up and he said, I'll match anything you raise in this room tonight. We stopped at 30,000. He matched it at 30,000 with everything that had already been raised. I think that little kid's painting has raised over $96,000. Wow. That's awesome. That has gone back to take care of people that were in his. So I I tell you that story uh, just to say that the significance of the give part of your culture is so incredible. And by the way, it, it's not just a matter of what your organization gives. Every one of you in this room, you have a passion. You have a community. You have an opportunity. My wife and I just started it. and Nobody came and told us we needed to start something. We just saw a passion. We saw a need. We saw a hole that needed to be filled, and we stepped in the gap, and we started trying to help these kids that have been abandoned, abused, and neglected. And every one of you in this room, have that ability in your own communities, man. I just, I encourage you to take that give part of your culture and just make it a part of what you do every day and just continue to give back to those in need. I just, again, I, I'm so impressed by, by what you guys are doing and, and your event every year where that, those, those dollars are going to support the charities that are near and dear to your heart. Uh, it's awesome. Uh, First Chance Foundation, by the way, you will be impacting a, a lot of kiddos. Uh, and, and not just in Texas. We don't just support in Texas when we get a need that needs to be filled. Uh, we, we took care of an entire elementary school in Illinois. My wife is from Illinois, and she had a friend that called and said, you know, we, we're in a low, I, if, if you ranked all of the school districts in the state of Illinois, they were absolutely at the rock bottom performance-wise. Well, they had high poverty. Uh, the kids were coming to school, they were hungry. They, I, to your point, it's, it's hard to negotiate when you're hungry. It's kind of hard to learn uh, when you're hungry too. Uh, so they were low because the kids weren't eating enough. They were coming to school in the same clothes every day. You know, the kids that are on uh, uh, some kind of a food program, many of them, they literally, I was on the, for, uh, on the board of directors for a, a food pantry, and uh, they're kids that literally will eat their last meal on Friday in that free program, and they don't eat again until Monday morning because mom and dad don't have anything at home for them to eat. Uh, those your local food pantries are incredibly important food banks that provide to those pantries I, man I, I am not very friendly when I'm hungry to your point being hangry that is not but you know what I have never in my life ever thought I am hungry but I don't know where I'm going to get my next meal and and the thought that in this country that we have people who don't who don't have enough and don't know where to go get it is just unacceptable It is complete, and it's bad enough when it's an adult. It is unacceptable when it's a child. Because a child just says, Mom, Dad, I'm hungry, and there's nothing there for them. Yeah. I understood that the the greatest impact that I can make when it comes to giving is not the amount of money that I can give away. The amount of money that I give away will actually be insignificant to the amount of money that the people in this room and the people in our organization We'll give away as we add it all up. We care a lot about your cause and what you do, and uh, you're a welcome addition to our culture. So thank you for coming thank today. You. Thank you. Thank you. Every time I listen to Ben talk, I just always take something away. Every time I hear Clint talk, I always take something away. And then I put the two of them together for this opportunity, Bob, and of course I'm going to take something away from it. Yet before I jump into it, 
What was your takeaway from this conversation between Ben and Clint? So you and I have, we've listened to this prior, and, and this is not the first time you and I have heard this, but we kind of both came away, I think, with something similar. And then look, there's a lot to be had in that discussion. The, the one thing that, that I kind of zeroed in on, I think you too, was this idea of authenticity and, and that these guys, like, we'll just take Ben, because I don't know Clint all that well. You know him a little bit better than I do. But Ben, he's the same person on stage in front of a thousand people as he is when there's 50 people around the podium after that, as he is when there's five of us in the room, as he is when you're one-on-one -on -one with him. Like he is this, he is the guy, and he's the same guy that we hear on this podcast, right? Like that's who he is. Like, why does that kind of, why for you is that such a big deal? You know, Bob, there are so many people out there that are just fake with the reality TV that's in today's world, with the image consciousness that's out there in today's world, with salespeople feeling they've gotta be on all the time, I really find that the more authentic we can be as a person, the more we connect. The better our connections will be, the better our business ends up becoming, the better our marriages end up becoming, the better our friendships end up becoming, because you know what you're gonna get. If you think about it, you probably have, just like I do, a group of friends from college, or high school that you're still friends with. And even though you might not see them all that often, you know as soon as you guys get together, you pick up right where you left off because you were always authentic. You grew up together. You don't have to be this persona around these people. Clint mentions it during the conversation. He's the exact same guy, whether he's doing his barbecue, whether he's working with his charitable organization that he's got, whether he's on stage in front of a whole bunch of people. And I think that's what makes Clint so likable and you want to connect with him. The exact same thing like you've said with Ben, it's what makes us want to listen to these podcasts. It's what makes us want to ask Ben more questions. It's what makes us want to take what he says and actually say, wow, he's not just giving me a line. He's actually sharing something real. Yeah. And he's living that that experience that he's sharing. Yeah. Authenticity is a huge takeaway. And I think it's something that's getting lost in our world more and more. Agreed. All right. So wherever it is you subscribe to podcasts, make sure you're subscribing to this one. And if you haven't been able to find it anywhere other than a link somebody maybe sent you, you could visit the winmakegive.com website, or you can always just pick up your cell phone and text the word podcast to 59559. Again, text the word podcast to 59559. We'll send you the link right to your phone to subscribe and keep you informed on all future episodes. Until the next one, remember, do good. Do good.